All right, so today I will be discussing torch infections and diving right into it, I think it is important that we first ask, what is a torch infection? Well, this refers to a group of diseases that may be acquired in utero or during birth. These congenital infections are very applicable to these children or these fetuses uh, because they are vulnerable to due to an underdeveloped immune system. They may cause congenital conditions, developmental abnormalities, uh, and actually contribute to childhood morbidity as well as mortality. So what does TORCH stand for? The next question that we should ask right there, it is an acronym. It represents common diseases that can cause congenital infection. It stands for toxoplasmosis, other including a variety of conditions including syphilis, varicella, and more, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and herpes simplex virus. And in discussing torch infections, it's important to determine the symptoms that are common amongst all torch infections. Uh, but furthermore, we will go later on into uh, symptoms that differ between the various conditions. So some common systems, symptoms do include development of rashes, irritability, anemia, fever, and hepatomegaly and splenomegaly. However, it is important to note that not all of these conditions will be, uh, or presentations will be uh, there for each disease state. Instead, they may vary between each. These are just general, broad, overarching symptoms. So how are torch infections identified and differentiated? Well, the diagnosis of torch infections are multifaceted. The first of which is that they are identified uh, by uh, observing specific symptoms, such as those common symptoms that I listed off, as well as those that are specific to individual or just a select few torch infections. Furthermore, performing a torch screening may allow you to get a more broad sense of what disease states you may have and then narrow it down. But of course, you first need to be aware or detect that there may be a torch infection present. It is important to note that not all torch infections are part of routine screenings. For example, while rubella is something that is typically a routine screening, things such as cytomegalovirus as well as toxoplasmosis are not routinely screened. And instead, we would only screen for these in a torch screening or if we have reason to suspect that there is an infection present. It is also important to be aware that in pregnant women, many of these diseases may present asymptomatically, making detection more difficult and transmission or uh, transmission of a congenital disease more likely. Therefore, we must remain vigilant in order to detect these as much as possible and prevent further uh, complications. Going into the torch infections then, I'm going to attempt to go through without creating a laundry list for you, but the first of which, the T of torch, is taxoplasmosis, toxoplasmosis. Uh, this is a parasite that may present as a maculopapular rash. You may have splenomegaly or hepatomegaly, as I stated before, common symptoms of torch infections, as well as chorioretinitis. This is the most common finding amongst infants and is an inflammation or a swelling of the posterior of the eye. Furthermore, intracranial calcification is a presentation present in toxoplasmosis that may help in identifying which disease state you have, as this is a presentation typically only present in toxoplasmosis as well as cytomegalovirus. Again, these presentations and symptoms help to narrow down what you're looking at. In order to diagnose toxoplasmosis then, you would have an ass assessment of serum antibodies or a PCR of the amniotic fluid or cerebrospinal fluid. Concerns over long-term effects of toxoplasmosis include visual impairment, deafness, learning disabilities, and even death. The parasite is transmitted via ingestion of raw undercooked meat as well as through exposure to things such as cat feces or soil. So it's important to cook meat safely and thoroughly wash fruits and vegetables. Really what we're attempting is prevention of a transmission of this disease to the pregnant mother. If a mother does be, or a pregnant woman does become infected, then it is important that they utilize treatment including spheromycin as well as a combination of other agents in order to prevent congenital, tra congenital transmission to the fetus. And if a child does develop or a baby does develop toxoplasmosis, we would again use those similar agents for a year's duration of treatment in order to treat toxoplasmosis. 
The R of torch then stands for rubella. With this, we see a presentation of low birth weight, again, splenomegaly and hepatomegaly, and then a maculopapular rash that may be slightly more uh, distinct in nature and help us in order to identify which disease state we have. We would detect it by looking at the rubella virus uh, IgM in fetal blood, and the long-term sequelae that we're concerned about include visual impairment, deafness, cardiac defects, as well as neurodevelopmental uh, disorders. This is transmitted via aerosol route, and so it's important that everyone receive an MMR vaccination prior to pregnancy. This will help to prevent transmission of rubella to pregnant women, uh, and ultimately will help to prevent the spread of the disease and the congenital infection as well. There is no treatment for the disease state, and so management of the infection is based upon supportive care. Cytome cytomegalovirus, the C of torch, uh, is a disease state, a virus that presents with low birth weight, thrombocytopenia, intracranial calcification, as I said before, is also present in toxoplasmosis, as well as a petechiae and purpura. Here we are concerned about hearing loss, blindness, and again, those neurodevelopmental delays. This is transmitted via bodily fluids. And so really we're again concerned about prevention of the transmission of this disease. So hand washing is important, especially after coming into contact with any secretions of children. Children may be carriers of this disease state. And on top of this, it is spread very quickly through places of high density of children, including things such as preschools. So again, those secretions we do want to avoid and also wash our hands after coming in contact with. If uh, the child is then symptomatic with cytomegalovirus. Our treatment options include intravenous gancyclovir or oral valgancyclovir for a total of six weeks. It may then be continued for six months if symptomatic, and this may improve or maintain hearing, which as we discussed was a concern in long-term outcomes. The H of torch infections, herpes simplex then, is a virus that is transmitted through different uh, mucosal uh, contact. It can present as a disseminated disease that affects organ systems throughout the body or may simply present as lesions of the skin, eyes, and mouth without any internal organ involvement. Finally, it may present as a CNS infection, which manifests in, uh, may include manifestations, may include seizures, lethargy, temperature instability, and other CNS represent presentations. It is important to note that disseminated disease may also affect CNS. Uh, and then depending on the disease state, you may see vesicular eruptions. These are those uh, lesions that you may see that actually do uh, contribute to spread of the disease. So the diagnosis depends on the uh, location of the disease, but you may culture the skin, eyes, rectum, and mouth, as well as do a serum PCR and a cerebrospinal fluid PCR. And our long-term concern is neurological development delays, but note that this may also lead to mortality in uh, infants. As I stated before, it does transmit via mucosal contact and treatment is acyclovir. It is a 20 milligram per kilogram dose every eight hours. And depending on the disease state that you have, it is for 10 days for those that have the uh, active lesions during delivery um, and the mother test positive. If the child is determined to have a skin, eyes, and mouth infection, then you would treat for 14 days, and it is important to treat for 21 days if there is involvement of the CNS or a disseminated disease. Here is a uh, graphic that more easily outlines uh, the um, treatment algorithm for herpes uh, simplex virus as well. Moving on to the other disease states, that O of torch. The first one and one that is very commonly associated with that other of torch is syphilis. This sexually transmitted disease may present with rhinitis, rash, hepatomegaly, as well as a slew of other conditions. And again, it is important to note that the transmission can be from uh, the mother to the fetus, as with all of these congenital uh, conditions. So we really wanna be on the lookout for this disease as it can be detrimental. Uh, we can detect this with a rapid plasminogen reagent screening on the mother, as well as an antibody test. But we're concerned about bone and joint problems, deafness, cranial nerve pal palsies. And again, we may have the issues with deformities as well as visual acuity. If it is detected in the mother during pregnancy, we can administer uh, 
penicillin in order to prevent the transmission. But if a child does become infected, then we would utilize either intramuscular benzathine or penicillin intravenous. Varicella is another virus that we see with torch. Uh, it presents with very distinct uh, scar tissue, overgrown lesions. These are very characteristic of varicella. But furthermore, there are also limb malformations. There is autonomic nervous system impairment. And so ultimately we see that this is very concerning uh, for a child, uh, the development of this disease. So we would diagnose this by either diagnosing the mother uh, or else observing the characteristic uh, symptoms that are present with varicella. We're concerned about limb mal uh, malformations, visual impairment, as well as neurological developmental delays with varicella. Uh, and it is transmitted through those secretions of those lesions that uh, was present on the previous page. Uh, in order to prevent this, the use of a varicella vaccine is very important, but if a newborn is determined to have the disease state, it is important then to administer varicella zoster immune globulin. And one that is a little bit more up to date in terms of what's been taking place in the news, the Zika virus. The Zika virus is a virus that targets neural progenitor cells and can lead to microcephaly or a, a malformation of the skull that leads to a smaller head size. And you may see functional abnormalities, structural brain defects, dysmorphisms. It is a disease state that is very concerning to have, especially for a pregnant uh, woman. Um, so it, when we're looking at long-term consequences of the disease state, we are concerned for hearing loss, blindness, and again, that uh, neurological uh, deficits. Um, it does originate from mosquito bites, and as there is no vaccine, it is important that pregnant women do reduce exposure to the virus by not traveling to areas in which there is known transmission of the Zika virus, as well as uh, coming into contact with those mosquitoes. Uh, so we focus on supportive care, though, if we observe a positive uh, identification of a disease state in a neonate. And finally, we'll discuss fifth disease, also known as parvo. It is uh, tr uh, transmitted via the parvovirus B19. It is a very distinct petechial rash. And furthermore, anemia is very commonly present with fifth disease. On top of this, we are concerned for neurodevelopmental delays or impairment in these uh, neonates. However, the data on this is conflicting. Some studies coming out of the Netherlands as well as Germany at the same time uh, did dispute as to whether or not neurodevelopmental delays were present in children long-term post uh, exposure to parvovirus. What we see very commonly with parvovirus is uh, anemia caused by toxicity to fetal red blood cell precursors. And so ultimately we get an accumulation of fluid in the soft tissues. This may be fatal if untreated. However, if a child is administered intrauterine blood transfusions, this may address the severe anemia. There is no vaccine against this virus either, and so prevention is aimed at reducing exposure to the virus during pregnancy. We see that torch infections may appear very similar to one another in terms of, of broad overarching symptoms. However, in identifying symptoms, you may narrow down the, your concerns and ultimately determine that a torch infection is present. Furthermore, torch screenings can then help to identify which uh, pathogen is present. Identification of the infection, both in pregnant women and newborns, is key to preventing long-term effects. We want to prevent the tr congenital transmission of the disease if possible, and if we are unable to prevent this transmission, it is important to treat as early as possible for many of these diseases in order to prevent any sort of development of these long-term effects. But as I said before, prevention is the best way to tr address these tor torch infections. We want to prevent or transmission of the disease state to the pregnant mother prior to any sort of risk of congenital transmission to a child. Our goal is to prevent transmission and to prevent long-term consequences or sequelae in infected individuals. And being uh, a pharmacist or in the pharmacy field, we may contribute to this by doing our due diligence. It is extremely important that we identify these and that we uh, tackle these disease states as we can. Thank you very much for listening to my discussion on torch infections. <laughs>